Hello, everyone. Welcome to Jacobin Talks, our series of lectures, interviews, debates with uh, leading figures on the left. Thank you for spending your Friday night on uh, socialist politics. My name is Paul Heidemann. I'm a teacher here in New York. And tonight, it is my pleasure to be interviewing Thomas Ferguson, Professor Thomas Ferguson, uh, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at um, um, Boston, uh, University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be, so tonight we'll be talking about the politics of the New Deal. Um, if you have seen these talks before, you know how it goes. We'll be um, talking for interviewing for about a half hour or so, and then have a half hour or so for questions. Um, that's the way it usually goes. Um, in terms of upcoming talks, uh, this weekend we have um, the weekend show with um, Anna and Nando, and their guest will be Ben Burgess. Um, that is 1 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, so make sure and check that out. Um, so, uh, Tom, thanks for talking to us tonight. And uh, so you're known as um, someone who forged a really distinctive and influential interpretation of the New Deal. Um, and we'll, we'll be talking a lot about that interpretation tonight. Um, but before we get into that, could we just talk for a little bit about how you came to study the New Deal? Um, what kind of put you on that path? Okay, well, this is pretty straightforward, Paul. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, especially I think these days, remember the old, when the period in the US when the two biggest picture magazines were Life and Look, and Life had an ad called Life Consider the Alternative. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I can just tell this very straightforwardly. I was a grad student at Princeton, and I was working on a thesis on formal theories of democracy. Um, and somebody then said to me, well, you know, uh, over in um, Sealy Mud Library uh, are Ivy Lee's papers and Bernard Baruch. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if anybody's looked at those. Uh, that, the obvious, because of course people have looked at Baruch, though they haven't actually done that much on it. Ivy Lee stuff much less looked at. Um, at any rate, so I went in there uh, with no particular preconceptions at all. I was thinking about the problems of party competition, and in my mind was this sort of classical set of questions uh, in, about the New Deal, like, well, everybody said that um the democrats were a labor party i thought it was perfectly obvious that that was just close enough to the truth to be very misleading and you know the new deal was not uh, a, a sort of social democratic regime like as in europe after world war ii um in many countries say you know germany occasionally in the netherlands or france or someplace France, less so, um, or Italy. Um, and uh, so I had this stuff on my mind. And why had other countries collapsed? You know, why did you get a new order instead of the New Deal, uh, say, in uh, Germany? Uh, what's the story? Anyway, so I just go in there, and within about five minutes, I come up with this quite uh, interesting discussion that Ivy Lee had written down. I should explain that Ivy Lee was famous as one of the co-inventors of American public relations and more generally public relations, I think pretty much anywhere. Uh, he got his start by uh, telling John D. Rockefeller to hand out dimes to kids to change his um, image. Uh, and he stayed at it for years. I mean, obviously, very close to the Rockefellers, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of other people too. If you're curious, the co inventor, Edwin L. Bernays, amazingly the nephew of Sigmund Freud. That's another discussion. Uh, but anyway, Ivy Lee, uh, so he's sitting there and he goes in to see Roosevelt in the fall of 1933. That's 
what we'll later get around to talking about the first new deal. And when the dollar is not stable, it's bouncing around because the U.S. has gone off gold. And he writes down this whole discussion, and he has this perfectly sensible discussion with Roosevelt, who's explaining to him, he's not thinking like an international economist, but he is saying things like, look, you know, we, we let the dollar go down. I, I need to get some demand up, I, I, et cetera. And he gives him a sort of perfectly sensible, non-technical account of what he's doing. Now, what stunned me was at Princeton, there was a long tradition of regarding uh, the people who did the major leaders in, in the monetary stuff in the New Deal, uh, by that I mean the Treasury Secretary, or for that matter, the President, as basically not that smart about what they were doing just ignorant. There's a real famous monograph that had come out of there, Stephen V. O. Clark, where he just portrays Morgenthau as just lost in thought. That's nonsense. But at any rate, um, it was certainly very well known. Anyway, so I read this thing, and then I went off to my job. I got hired at MIT, and so I was uh, there, and I told Charles Kendallberger, uh, who I knew is a friend of mine, uh, and he says to me, I just, that can't be true. Roosevelt didn't have any real ideas of what he was doing. Uh, uh, he just was a kind of a quarterback, throw any play he wanted. Well, that's not really true. And that got me, so I said, you know what? I may be trying to model a system that I don't understand. And so I spent a lot of time in a lot of business archives, first in the U.S., and then in, in Britain, France, Germany. Those are sometimes other papers and things. But a lot of times you find stuff in the New Deal. Uh, also relevant. I mean, one arm and hammer, for example, I didn't find it in the archives, but uh, somebody else uh, knew about it. Uh, arm and hammer, who, you know, was, um, he actually collected cash for Roosevelt in 32 among the champagne producers because part of the platform was let's abolish prohibition. Uh, we'll come back, maybe we won't come back to that, but anyway. So that got me started, and I spent a long time in there. And then it eventually occurred to me, you know, there's a pretty straightforward way of thinking about this whole problem, which is, why don't you recognize that labor is pretty weak? It's sufficiently weak that it can't organize its own political party. That actually takes a lot of strength and a system. It's not a multi, the US doesn't have a multi-party system. It's got those basically two big political parties and there are a lot of institutional forces that create that. So then it struck me, okay, so now what I need is some way of trying to assess who would possibly coalesce with labor into back the same candidate, because that's essentially what's going on in the New Deal. And when you get, you know, tear yourself away from all the talk about how Democrats are the party of labor, it's what happened in all of the post-World War II uh, Democratic cabinets, which, you know, Kennedy and Johnson are perfectly good examples. They're full multinational business executives, not uh, labor leaders. I sometimes had one, usually in the labor department, but that was it. Um, and at that point, I said, well, you know what? Um, you could probably model this. And that's essentially what I did. It's pretty, I can just express the basic idea uh, I think very simply, it's that uh, who can't possibly go into coalitions with uh, businesses? And the answer is the businesses that with labor, who's if you're thinking from a business standpoint, the answer is labor intensive businesses really hate it. Their wage bill is very high. Their wage bill is percentage of value added to get somewhat technical is is very high. And those folks are going to be the least likely. The folks who are capital intensive, on the other hand, they've got a real option. So that got me one part of the way. And then the other part of the way was to start thinking about, and what if there were other issues besides labor uh, and unions in that? Now, in the New Deal, you don't have to worry about that. That's right up front. Uh, there, You can't miss it. Um, but... Um, and then I said, so, well, what if international trade were an issue? I give some credit to my old friend Jim Kurth for sort of bringing that very forcibly to my attention um, at the time. And uh, so then it was pretty easy to sort of see, well, you know what? The technologies that made you the dominant uh, player in the world economy uh, in the 1930s and for many decades thereafter, were typically capital, they made you capital intensive too. 
There were a few capital intensive industries that were not, of which the chemical industry for decades was one. I mean, the chemical people didn't get into the European markets as sort of dominant uh, into the 50s and 60s, not, not earlier than that. They were always behind the Germans. There's a lot to be said about that. We're not gonna say it tonight. Anyway, so I sort of tunneled my way through a lot of archives and arrived at that. That's how I got to the New Deal, Paul. It was basically just the experience of finding out that, uh, you know what, America's the real dark continent. People are writing about this thing all the time and they just don't do primary research. I was pretty amazed, for example, to compare in the standard New Deal history counts of who was doing what bill preparations and discussions and not seeing the business guys. They're actually all over the archives. If you take the trouble to look, most people writing about this then or now do not. So that's really interesting because you're essentially saying you found your what you, you moved kind of from abstract models to the archives and then back to a kind of reconsidered abstract model of politics in a country like the United States where labor isn't strong enough to get a, a party of their own. And, you know, I, I think kind of what you're saying is a lot of understandings of politics basically assume that, like, the party system in the U.S. and in Europe work in basically the same kind of way. And your argument is you, you have to draw a sharp line between them because the absence of a labor party changes everything. Is yeah, that right? or, or we did. I mean, in the sense that Politics in Europe is now coming to resemble the U.S. case to a lot, uh, meaning that labor unions are getting smaller, weaker, have been I since at least the late 1970s and earlier. And if you want to understand a good chunk of Europe, I think you're well advised to sort of study some of this type of stuff. But yeah, that's basically uh my take now i would add the implication for this is pretty straightforward which is the sort of the lot of the biggest opponents of this type of thinking are sort of very orthodox marxists uh, and they that's really hard to deal with i mean they just can't i think especially in europe i think that's the main reason why political theories in europe have been just so endlessly going around the mulberry bush uh because everybody's i mean it's like it's highly polarized between folks who don't want to talk about labor at all and lots of folks who are insistent that there's got to be a labor party or some party's got to represent labor no that's not what happens when people are weak they still got sometimes at least have to get into politics uh, and so then you got to sort of work your political dynamics out through that so Okay, um, let's get a little bit into the weeds on the New Deal now. Yep. Um, so Roosevelt's first 100 days are a really famous kind of, you know, uh, initiation of the New Deal, right? When all of these programs are passed. Um, what, what's going on with the first 100 days and, and what have you found is what's going on behind the scenes? Okay, let me, let me back up though to begin with the slide to the abyss in the previous couple of years there, uh, really specifically from May and June of 1931. I mean, we all know the U.S. depression started, you know, after the Wall Street crash in October 1929. Um, Depression started in Germany a year earlier, and in other places it had all kinds of different timing. But um, the collapse of Europe in the summer of 1931 was a gigantic event. Um, I've written about that with Peter Temin and other you know, folks, but you know. Uh, but the point to understand is at that point, um, you had some pretty the the American government had to decide a number of thing of options to do. One of them was about a debt moratorium. We won't need to go into that tonight, but the political importance of this for the U.S. is, is stunning. Um, in that, um, if you read any number of books, including a whole host of people who should know better, uh, they will actually tell you, even Adam Tooze, who I think is a great historian, uh, I reviewed one of his books when I can't, earlier, uh, now, it tooses the deluge, for example, repeats the stuff about Joan Hoff Wilson and others that Hoover wasn't basically talking to bankers. Well, this is, I'm sorry to admit this, a generation ago, I published a long piece in a very prominent journal. It's, I don't know, it's been cited, I don't know, 
hundreds of times. Um, that, uh, in fact, there were phone transcriptions in the Lamont Library papers, um, the, um, where, sorry, in the business uh, history uh, archive at Harvard, in the Lamont papers. Um, and they've got the phone transcriptions between the Morgan House, House of Morgan and Hoover. I mean, now that's a little crazy that 30 years later, people are still like, this, this is pretty important for the, for the uh, New Deal. What happened was this, is that after that period especially, um, Hoover became more and more fixated on sort of, if you like, the conservative solution to problems. Now, we can just bypass some things that went on in the Federal Reserve in the early 1930s, but the bottom line, especially, sorry, in the uh, 1932, we'll just let it go. I've written a lot about that. The bottom line is, is that Hoover wasn't willing to push for any kind of bailouts. And he had a lot of support of the business community from one is tempted to say the usual suspects to do it. Um, so even in the last uh, month or two, uh, the uh, Morgan partners and their friends were mostly, were, with one exception on that, were trying to uh, reelect Hoover. They did all called meetings and things like that. I've written this stuff up, but um, they failed. Now, Roosevelt at that point um, was uh, not, he, he had been opposed even in the Democratic Convention. This is a fantastic story and it's worth repeating. He almost didn't get the nomination uh, in 1932. He had a variety of people running against him, but the final guy was Newton Baker um there who had been an attorney for the federal reserve board and a lot of other things baker wasn't a terrible guy himself but he was a kind of naive tool that was easily pushed around and he had so none of it worked uh but a lot of bankers had spent a lot of time and other folks including a lot of utility companies which were at that time close to the banks trying to push them on it roosevelt survived um he you know he got the nomination uh, and then, uh, you know, he gave forgotten man speeches and things like that. This forgotten man was a figure of speech there. Um, I think it was a Minneapolis speech, as I recall. But anyway, uh, point is, he comes into power. And the question, there's a pretty famous uh, interlude there. I mean, in the old, bad old days, uh, the U.S. government, you know, you'd have an election in November, but you didn't, the president didn't take over until March. So Hoover was trying to get Roosevelt to agree to a World Economic Conference policy package that would have effectively, uh, this is, I'll just cut to the chase here. It really would have um, kept the U.S. right pretty much where it was unless they could get universal agreement. They weren't going to, there was no chance that was going to happen. And um, so what? by then you had a lot of business interests, including a lot of oil companies uh, and many manufacturers saying it was time to get off the gold standard. Um, and they were campaigning for it. And some of those folks reached Roosevelt. Uh, right in the final days, as, as all the banks in the United States collapsed um, there. Um, and Roosevelt coming into office did get off gold. Um, he did do a variety of reforms, but he was uh, running a whole series of strange proposals, including one that would, I mean, the preferred uh, answer for a lot of industrialists was let us cartelize. Let's just form a cartel and let us raise prices on people. That's your recovery. Um, that became the National Recovery Act. Um, and uh, they did it. The first pack, that, however, immediately posed the problem of what do you do with organized labor uh, in that? Because just imagine if you allow sort of hyperbolically universal cartelization and you don't fix the price of labor. I'm actually quoting a letter that Baruch wrote. Uh, I think Hugh Johnson, one of the folks who were actually writing the bill. Um, and uh, you got to do something about that. So they said, okay, you can form company unions. Again, I'll wave through you know, pages and pages of qualifications to get that. That set off an enormous amount of labor conflict. And uh, there, was a there was a revival 
uh, as they took over the banks, quickly certified those. It was very different from what, say, Obama did in 2008. They didn't do a massive quantitative easing and, and bankroll every bank around. They uh, insisted on actually seeing if these guys were sound or not. And uh, if they weren't, they got closed. Then they reopened them, although, in fact, a lot of weak banks were being propped up uh, by the government, either through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation or through the Fed. We'll come to that later. Uh, anyway, bottom line on this is the first New Deal's package of reforms, things like the Glass-Steagall Act, the Separated Investment Commercial Banking, the NRA, the Help for Farmers, triggered labor fights. Um, it also um, didn't work. That was the fundamental the idea that you could just cartelize your way to prosperity was not a good one. Um, now, people were fighting on the Federal Reserve. What I found when I got into their minutes, they would actually discuss technical from political uh, adjustments to the money supply. Uh, and the Secretary of Treasury was a fairly conservative bird, but he died uh, and was promptly then replaced by Henry Morgan. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, Morgan thought the and then um, the uh, later the that Roosevelt got was able to replace Mariner Eccles uh, on the uh, as the chairman of the Fed and then you got effectively a financial and uh, team uh, in both the Treasury and the Fed that actually wanted to work with the president um, that helped. But in the meantime, it was a sort of generally chaotic situation, and the courts were being used to challenge those policies. A lot of those were setups. Uh, my favorite being the uh, Sheck the Poultry ca case, that where the they the eventually led to the court uh, throwing out the uh, NRA. Uh, that was being bad. I mean, that was those folks were being helped by steel companies basically who didn't like the thing either by then because they were getting their prices fixed by gm at the other end and, um, anyway bottom line on all this was the first new deal didn't work meantime a lot of people were very unhappy um and uh so roosevelt had to look around for something else now, you have to sort of follow this along a couple of dimensions. First, you have splits inside the labor movement. The American Federation of Labor um, was a highly conservative operation of nearly all, couple exceptions, craft unions. Um, and they're famous for their lethargy. I mean, they were being asked by people to come in and organize them, and they wouldn't do it. Well, one thing I discovered was they actually had a bank that a number of the top officials were officials in, that bank went bust, um, and then some friendly corporations recapitalized it for them. Um, eventually, everybody knows that John L. Lewis uh, and others led the uh, movement to form the CIO, Congress of Industrial Organizations, uh, and uh, an effect split from the AFL. I mean, the lesson I came from from that stuff was, you know, it's probably a big mistake to think that your formal labor organizations, even in a huge national emergency, will necessarily do very much. Um, that there are lots of ways to sort of give the leadership, if not the mass, incentives on this. I think that's a very important lesson from the uh, early New Deal. This, this, this one was a process, not an event. It took from 33 to 35 to get the AFL sort of really well organized and get going. And then actually, you know, the, much of the growth was later and even after the 36 election. Anyway, but coming back to Roosevelt, um, he has a problem from eh, May and June of 1935 on. A lot of his programs unconstitutional. He's got big chunks of the business community uh, rising against him, notably at a uh, chamber of commerce uh, meetings and things like that. Um, and what you then find is you get this block of businesses coming over in pieces. The leadership is coming out of oil. The oil industry logic on this was they needed something like the NRA to keep uh, the oil. Oil prices had actually fallen to a dime a barrel in 1931-32. Uh, 
And I had the good fortune to know some of the old oil leaders who gave me their papers. So I could actually see into this with a really sharp uh, sense of it. And they were actually passing the hat to send political money to Roosevelt in the summer of 1935, when there weren't very many people in the business community really that favorable to him. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, it's in the case of uh, the bills that passed, the General Electric and Standard Oil were willing to support the Standard Oil Chair, were willing to support the um, Social Security Bill, which also had the unemployment bill. Um, the question of what became the Wagner Act is a lot more complicated. Um, bottom line was very few people in the business community supported that. Um, head of Mead Paper, which was a big capital intensive place, did. Um, the whole, the rest of the story is too complicated for a simple uh, story. But the bottom line was on the combination of the Wagner Act, uh, Social Security, um, and some bills that passed around them, one of them that made it illegal to carry firearms across to uh, state lines for labor disputes. Um, the, uh, that really did change the the, both the political atmosphere and the facts on the ground. Suddenly private armies were not okay. Private armies had dominated in American labor relations. The Pennsylvania Coal and Iron Police were bigger uh, than the state police, for example, and they were controlled by the firms in uh, coal and steel. Um, that stuff now was facing both legal ch challenges and political pushback. Um, and then comes the trade question, which is what really rescues Roosevelt to a considerable extent. Um, the trade issue boiled up to this. It's ever since the U.S. was a net creditor uh, as a result of World War I, because it loaned tons of money back and people owed it uh, out there, um, the uh, chunks of the even big business wanted to change American tariff policy, which was all pretty much high tariffs as policy with exception, very few exceptions uh, there. As multinationals grew up in the 20s and, and moved around in the world in that, that wind strengthened, but they never got anywhere near there. But anyway, at the NRA, the National Recovery Act, was Part of the cartelization package was high tariffs. That people knew that at the time. They knew it the day it passed. I mean, it's easy to prove. Um, and at the same time, a lot of folks were worried about, well, what do we do with it? I mean, the old free traders were thinking, okay, we have to put up with this while we get off the bottom of the ocean, the Marianas Trench, if you like, of the Depression. But do we really want to do this? Um, and then as everything crumbled, uh, Beardsley Rummel, who was um, basically a top political advisor to the Rockefellers, and who had con he controlled the Spellman Fund, and he led a lot of initiatives. He had actually personally drafted, not the people who are the history books credited, big chunks of the original uh, Agricultural Adjustment Act. Believe it or not, whether I mean that's a fact that has only popped out in the last decade or so. Um, anyway. The um, Rummel and other people persuade Roosevelt, why don't we uh, start an inquiry into reciprocal trade? They do that. Uh, and then his, his Secretary of State, Cordell Hall, who'd been shut out of the first New Deal um, completely, um, but who was also probably the strongest free trader uh, of the age, uh, they push Roosevelt to actually. Uh, put up a bill, they pass it, and it gives them the authority to start cutting tariff uh, on a reciprocal basis with other countries. And so all goes out and negotiates a lot of treaties. Those are extremely controversial in the business community. You go into the 1936 election, and uh, Roosevelt is now in favor of this thing, right? Free trade and social welfare. If that sounds like the political formula of the Democratic Party between about 1936 to, I'm tempted to say 1976, though the Cheshire Cat grin continues right on down to 2020, maybe. Uh, but the sort of serious components of that, that's Roosevelt. Well, the when the Republican um, 
candidate, Alf Landon, um, who begins to criticize the trade treaties after he's reached by a bunch of chemical companies and others. I, I tell that story. And I, um, you see the free traders begin to back out of um, the whole rows of, begin to back out of the Republican coalition. And so you get a whole string of them. There's actually a meeting in Wall, Wall Street. I think we had the New York Times there. Yeah, these folks all, um, they actually meet a few days before the election and say they've really got to elect Roosevelt. Um, the outgoing bank, uh, the, uh, the outgoing bank, U.S. Uh, major bank association quits and uh, he's outgoing, sorry, he doesn't quit, he, but he endorses Roosevelt. And then you get a string of very famous free traders, uh, including Henry Stimson uh, and um, Will Clayton. Uh, and eventually even well, Ellsworth Bunker was already on board. I, uh, Bunker's are very nice. These folks all favor free trade. They join James Warburg also. They bail out on the Republicans, though Bunker was in from the start, uh, and um, just push this New Deal package across. Bunker's a perfect symbol of this because, of course, I mean, you can draw a direct line between Roosevelt's 36 campaign, and Bunker raised a bunch of money for it, uh, and he's, of course, the last guy onto the helicopter um, in the 60s as the U.S. leads leaves Vietnam. I mean, this sort of the multinational formula of free trade and social welfare was hugely popular, and it's coming directly out of the Second New Deal. Uh, so that's that's if you want in the weeds. Now we might all take you tell me, but I think we probably want to talk about what then went wrong uh, a little bit. Yeah. I think that would be great. Maybe before we do, we can just um, talk a little bit more about these two kind of spectrums that you've described that kind of really shape the politics of the New Deal. So we have um, capital intensive versus labor intensive and multinational versus national. That's and right. could you just that, maybe give some examples? Yeah, basically the, your, your average yeah, multinational the exception of the chemical industry is generally capital intensive at that point. The, the most important one of those at that time is the big internationally integrated oil company uh, where petroleum refining, you could actually run refineries uh, with just staff folks. Um, yeah, I think there's too much detail in that graph for folks. We probably don't, but basically, uh, well, yeah, machinery, farm implements, uh, one auto company maybe. The auto companies were right on the cusp of this. They liked free trade, but they had a big labor force. Um, and so that doesn't, uh, that was a problem. Anyway, let's, um, that's the, the basic story uh, there. Um, and it's the, look, it's the underlying structure of the firm calling it technologies too is what people do all the time. Uh, it's not a good idea because the technology does respond to sort of social imperatives. David Noble's beautiful old book, Forces of Production, just shows you how machine tools were shaped uh, around that. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is, this is a big story. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so these are the dynamics shaping why some firms line up behind the New Deal and some firms fight it like, you know, like it's that. Is. Well, yeah. And yeah, it's worth remembering that while the CIO contributed a substantial amount of money and other labor unions, my memory is around 700,000 bucks, the business community came in with four or five times that. Mm. Uh, I mean, there, they could, you could not make the case that, I mean, they're just not, the Democratic Party never was a pure labor vehicle. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't then, then it isn't now uh, a fortiori. You know, so there we are. Yeah. So that, that provides us then uh, with a nice uh, pre, when you, when you say that, and then, you know, you said, let's get into what gets wrong. I think that gives us a hint about what went wrong. Well, okay, look. All right, now here as we go into the darkest parts of the thing, I even saw a guy the other day sort of talking about how Mariner Eccles must have been the main force for pushing the New Deal. 
into its expansion. That was true, 33, 34, 35, 36. But, I mean, here I've done the work. I'm not sure that anybody else really has. Um, Eccles owned uh, a bunch of things, but one of them was one of the so-called big six construction companies. So big six at that point wasn't so huge. They were doing at that point a number of dams in the far west. And um, the nicest thing I can say is Eccles, I mean, he's a smart guy and he's definitely not a normal business figure from the period. Uh, make no claim. And he was quite willing to try stuff that nobody else would. But he was also crazed on the subject of wages. I'm not making this up. He would have his economic advisor, one Lachlan Curry, uh, bring him every as soon as they had it the latest wage figures and he'd study and he didn't like it and there were claims i mean now if you go back and look at the wages there's been endless discussion about this we're not going to go into it tonight um my take um which is pretty much that of my friend peter temmons in his piece trashing out prescott and the other folks who uh, nobel prize winner who you know tried to make contrary claims at best, you have bottlenecks here in some industries. You don't have general wage rises. And the notion that uh, you were on the edge of a big wage rise that was killing is, is crazy. Um, all right, we'll just put it at that. But, you know, I think it's fair to say that Eccles was not quite too concentrated on general wages. He really was looking at construction, which is it's easy to show. Um, other people were do doing their thing too, but you know, people didn't like um, much of what they were seeing in labor markets. Are the, and Roosevelt was talking about packing the court, uh, et cetera. Anyway, um, but here's the point. So Roosevelt himself, you know, approves cuts in the budget right after the election of '36. Uh, and the Fed raises rates a lot. That, of course, gives you an infinite uh, number of games to play. Which one was really fatal? My answer on that is both were. Um, and they proceeded to uh, put the economy into, uh, put the brakes on and throw it into a reverse um, course. Now, if that sounds familiar, let's try to generalize this. This is, in other words, you start a recovery. And the advocates of austerity bring you uh, excessively high interest rates, claims about, you know, full, you're at full employment or you're running over it or wages, et cetera, and the recovery's aborted. That's what happened uh, there in uh, 37. Um, and um, this, this is a lesson, this is a trick that's been turned many times since. Yeah. Don't bet against it being turned again in uh, 2021, depending on uh, who comes to power. Um, but anyway, the um, so the austerity folks are sitting around, and the that recession of 37, 38 is really pretty terrifying. It's as deep uh, as the New Deal. It just didn't break it, 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 there. So uh, eventually, Rummel, Beardsley Rummel and company go to Roosevelt. Actually, Rommel actually goes down to uh, Warm Springs, which was uh, where Roosevelt was in Georgia, and sells him on a recovery plan. Now, there's no question at all that Rommel had been reading Keynes, and so had his folks. Um, and uh, this is often said to be the first time a government actually sort of implemented Keynesian policies. That's okay, but boy, with a big caveat, because Roosevelt didn't really believe it. They stopped again prematurely. I mean, what bailed them out of this was the slide uh, into World War II, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I don't disagree with Robert Gordon when he says, yeah, it's, it's clearly the extra spending there to getting ready for military preparation. And then there were a lot of exports. I mean, uh, the neutrality legislation that the Roosevelt administration had allowed lots of military exports. That sound familiar? It's because it is. Um, and so um, European countries were buying a lot. That eventually pulled the U.S. back out of the depression. But I mean, this this was not exactly a triumph of policy making 
uh, in macroeconomic policy terms, but it worked better than the alternative, which would have been doing nothing and going right back to where you were uh, in uh, 32. So that's a, a great point to get us into some of the questions. Uh, so, you know, uh, some might say this is a deflationary account of the New Deal. Um, the New Deal occupies uh, a particular point in the American political imagination, um, perhaps especially for progressives, as a kind of ideal to return to. Um, and we could say that your work is really complicating that. So. Um, do American progressives make the New Deal out to be uh, a bigger deal than it, than it was? Well, somebody like Arthur Schlesinger does when he wants that progressive interpretation of American history and says there's an you know, alternate between pro-business and anti-business. You can't treat the New Deal seriously in those terms. That's just nonsense, okay? I mean, Roosevelt was not trying to bring socialism to America, no matter how many one is tempted to say Republican candidates. I don't get into politics now, but Republican candidates then and later have frequently accused him of that. Um, there's there's no truth to that. On the other hand, uh, let's let's also give credit where credit is due. The Wagner Act and then the ensuing massive organizing by the CIO. I mean, I basically agree with Sidney Lenz, who basically talks considerably about um, the way the AFL was then used by conservative businesses to unionize since they were otherwise going to get organized in some areas by CIO unions. You know, of the electrical industry is, I think, a very clear case of that. Um, but the uh, that led to the big spurt in unionization, and for sure that had a big impact it, and it ramified through a lot of American life into the states. Now, this did not continue after World War II. The Very famously, the CIO's Operation Dixie, uh, which was an attempt to extend unionization of the South, failed after the war. Um, and so, you know, the North-South split uh, there, which had been important in the New Deal, it certainly did limit actions, although I don't hold the really dark view of the New Deal that said they did nothing whatever for black Americans. I mean, actually, the Southern Democrats mostly didn't want relief to black Americans at all, and they were included in those, especially in the early relief packages. And then some parts of the Agriculture Department for a while actually did try to work with tenants. That was, however, you know, people who, it's a, it's, it's still, uh, a terrible chapter. It didn't, they did not trying to write a clean slate for either Roosevelt, the New Deal, or anything there. But, you know, compared to what they'd come before it, it was a considerable improvement. And in many parts of the United States, uh, and yes, it was the, the, the question, particularly uh, the way unionization tended uh, not to distribute all over the place, although it's important to remember, even in some parts of the South and the West, unions did grow, um, and then they were rolled back in the, the late 40s uh, there. So uh, I'm, what, did the New Deal improve the average American with a lot of qualifications, especially on race and on gender? Yes, I'd say. With those qualifications, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's not like you're going to get something better by going to the pre-New Deal period. If you want the Gilded Age, well, wait a while if you're not already living in it. So uh, another question is, um, how does the New Deal? How, how would you then say we should think about the New Deal in relationship to like European social democracy? How does it compare with some of the achievements of, uh, of social democracy? And, and how is it? All right, the insanity, of course, is how did European social democracy get to Europe? Really, not by some normal process. I mean, the truth is, you know, the key installation was the German Social Democratic Party in Germany. And the guy who did it was the New Deal, was a New Dealer at that point, John J. McCloy, who'd been, uh, what, undersecretary or assistant secretary under Stimson. Um, and, you know, they just told the Germans, you may not like it, but you're going to have unions. I mean, the, the entire American occupation, 
and the German occupation is obviously running very different from the other countries there. Um, I just told them, you're going to have, in effect, a kind of New Deal structure. Now, nobody just fits a New Deal structure into countries any more than they did in Japan and gets exactly New Deal results. But uh, that's one point to make. It's obvious that the welfare state never grew in the United States to anything like the extent, nor did labor unions, okay? I mean, depending on how you measure, you know, is it the workforce uh, in agriculture too or not, and things like that. Uh, you know, but, you know, somewhere maybe a third or a little more of the workforce reaches the top in the late 40s and early 50s. And a good deal of that is thanks to World War II, where the large companies that had government contracts were told you've got to unionize or else. There, that's a case where politics really mattered. It's a case for using government contracting, um, I think, there. Um, well, uh, that changed the balance of power in the U.S., but Look, you know, you'll you'll you'd know it if the Democratic Party ever were a social democratic party. Doesn't amount to the same thing, doesn't do it, but because the American economy grew for a while in the post-war period, grew in no small part, I think, because of that synthesis, uh, which did use economic policy to try to actually maintain the um uh, national income when it would fall. You know, they basically walked away from that. Everybody did from the 70s and 80s on, except uh, for saving banks and for when things really get disastrous, then the state just piles in. Uh, but um, no, the, the U.S. made a big step forward, never reached sort of European social democratic uh, le levels. Um, and, uh, you know, but now the European social welfare states aren't reaching those levels either. You are running history backward, which makes that whole model of mine in my basic paper very applicable to a lot of countries. So um, another question uh, we've gotten is, what does this model of uh, the way politics works in a country like the United States have to say for how progressive legislation can get passed today? What does what the experience of the New Deal reveal to those trying to, you know, protect income um, at a time when it seems like, uh, you know, the Republicans certainly are interested in destroying as much of it as possible? Yeah, and a lot of Democrats don't love it. Um, I mean, you can just see all the giant enthusiasm for extending medical care uh, in general uh, to the population, right? Um, the short, blunt answer is if you want something to happen, you need to organize. Um, and I would add, um, as they did in the New Deal, um, <clears throat> the threat of replacing people works really well. I, the, I mean, if you, this is it, it's not a good idea to directly compare the mid the late 30s with American politics today. There's an awful lot that's different. Uh, but the only way you're going to see any real change is to uh, threaten both Republicans and Democrats who stand in the way of major reforms. Uh, so long and the short of it. I mean, the notion that, uh, I mean, there were some wonderful polls. There's actually from the psychological journals of the period, you can, from the 30s, you go back in there and you can really read some interesting stuff where they would actually ask people what they really wanted. And you will find that a good chunk of the population, there's a brilliant piece I remember reading, where a guy who went around and he interviewed people and he said, you know what, these people really want the Republican Party. They're hoping the Republicans, which they were traditionally the dominant party outside the South at that point, um, they really like the Republicans to introduce socialism. And so you get all this pathetic uh, stuff about we're going to appeal to the business community or something. Well, you know what? If you're waiting for the business community to move, it didn't move. All the parts of it did, but most of it didn't in the 30s. And you know, I'll, I hope to live to see the day that we have a uh, united um, business community saying, yeah, we actually favor Medicare for all, just like we favor single payer insurance for banks, which we, we have the one and not the other. Along those lines, could you um, say a little bit about how the industrial structure of politics today has, has shaken out? 
Oh. Um, <laughs> now look here. Um, this is a subject of which I've been treating a lot, along with my colleagues Paul Jorgensen and Ji Chen. You know, we've written a number of papers on recent elections. And in particular, we sort of show you that uh, a, a result that I would hardly have believed until I saw it, uh, that so-called linear model of elections, which just basically says it turns out in election after election since 1980, if you want to predict <clears throat> the party split in the uh, votes, get the party split in the money. It's um, And we have, I think, in our recent paper, uh, out in 2019, shown you that you cannot reconcile that with any view that, for instance, the money was following the polls. We 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 show you that can't be true using gambling odds and things like that. Um, but look, this is an enormously complicated business. It is complicated partly because the old financial story. You now find lots of financiers actually running firms, private equity and things like that, leveraged buyouts where they get business, directly in the business of, if you like, wiping the labor force. That was something that mostly didn't happen in the 30s finance. Um, and, I mean, the battles were inside the industrial firms. But, this is a, but can I duck this question or offer to come back after the election and explain it in simple English? Because, I mean, look, this is... Uh, let me just make the basic point. The, the, I, I, the old version of this I wrote up, uh, the investment theory of political parties, basically says that political parties uh, are aggregations basically of investors. Why? It's not because people that can't figure out what they want. It's just it's immensely costly for folks to get into politics. And so power passes by default into the hands of people who can bear those costs. The implication of that is you never see the average voter a median voter in technical terms, they don't determine any outcomes. And the interesting thing to me is you've now reached in political sciences position where lots of folks have actually tried to test this. They find that the you know, median voter theory always fails, but they can't bring themselves to get into the question of money and politics. You even get these folks saying, well, you know, it must be they're really following, I don't know, the... 10th or 15th percentage in terms of the upper income groups uh, of voters. They're not following voters at all. Uh, the thing that works best is, uh, you know, the higher up you can go in the income level and get their views, that will actually explain some outcomes along with some direct political alliance stuff. Um, but median voters don't explain anything. They, they just don't drive any policy. The Gillens and Page stuff is, I think, clear on that. But it's fun to watch people just turn in circles. They can't say, you know, this system is money driven. That's what it is. Uh, and so uh, that's, I'm, I don't want to just say no to your question, Paul, but give me a break. I mean, uh, the New Deal is one topic. You want American politics today? That's another. I think I think that's enough to get to get people started there. Um, we have another question from the comments. Um, was the the stability of the New Deal, you know, after World War II, the New Deal order, was that just kind of contingent on American industrial dominance worldwide? And I think the implication of this question is in a world like today, where you know uh, increasingly American industrial dominance is is challenged, is something like the New Deal even possible again? Um, all right, let's let's decompose this a bit. And if I forget one aspect of it, you just bring me back on the part that I omitted. But let's first, there's a real important point to make. The basic question is, I'd say, yeah, you had to have really dominant firms that were world leaders, and that made it easy uh, to do wage rises and things like that. Don't forget, though, that there were constant attempts to roll the New Deal back. I mean, that almost as interesting as the New Deal itself is what happened in 45, 46, 47, 48, where uh, you had a vast new anti-New Deal offensive cooked up in the, in the, during the World War II by all kinds of business groups. And, you know, in steel and automobiles, uh, for example, they tried to roll back uh, the New Deal. Now, this is roughly this. I, I've written 
not the parallel, the World War I parallel. At the end of World War I, there was a big strike wave and a series of industrial conferences and things like that. And then unionization actually rose very rapidly for a brief period, then was blown away by massive employer organizing. Um, people tried the same thing at the end of World War II and they failed. They couldn't blow out the unions in the car industry and steel and some other big unions. They did halt the unionization in the South uh, there. And so uh, there were a lot of efforts to destabilize. And after that, um, I think you got into something like trench warfare, meaning in trench warfare, after you've lost a you know big one, you wait a while before you go back out um, to try another big bet. So you just find whittling away. You find, you know, the Landrum Griffin amendments, uh, although there were some real labor union abuses. I'm not writing uh, sort of like free, free parking tickets for union leaders that are corrupt. Okay, that's a serious problem. Um, the, uh, but the Landrum Griffin Act made it harder for labor unions. Lyndon Johnson and a lot of other people spent a great deal of time making sure that they didn't extend unionization in the private sector, though Johnson did in the public sector, um, in the federal government. And ever since then, you know, Democratic Party leaders have talked union help, but then they just don't deliver very much. Uh, and so you get, you know, uh, big efforts, you know, under Obama, a lot of unions were rolled back, including a lot of places. It's easy to show in states that the uh, Democrats lost in 2016. There, a number of the states that surprised people were Michigan, you know, say, uh, Pennsylvania, where they had once had bigger unions. Uh, and so, uh, well, we'll all have to see what happens. But so in that sense, it's not just world dominance. You know? The question is about what's your domestic uh, social conflict situation. That's very important. That said, for sure, the question about um, the, the co internationally competitive character of your enterprises matters a lot. Okay, well, I think that is a great place for us to wrap it up, and that is that class conflict and political economy are what matters, and they're what you need to look at if you want to explain well, anything. That's, a good, um, that's the place so, to start. Let me qualify myself for all those folks who are really convinced that hegemony <laughs> is the problem you need to penetrate, hegemony <laughs> who grows out of this type of situation. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much for this time. Right, thanks really thanks for having me, yep. and stay healthy. All right. Thanks.